I'm Dr. T and welcome to my lab. That's fire. <laughs> uh, normally you don't put it on the balance to burn, but um, we got some candles going really to make a point. And fire is one of the oldest chemical reactions that as humans we have harnessed. It's still absolutely essential for a modern world. And it's been essential since, well, we've been humans. Human society doesn't exist without it. So of course then there's a the question, what is it? And that question has been essential since time immemorial. How do you control it? How do you get it to work? How do you get it to do what it's doing? And to do that, to answer those questions, you need to know what is it? What's going on? In the 17th century, we thought we had an answer. Uh, turns out it was wrong, but I'm still going to tell it to you anyways. The key part though, and the reason why I've got a balance here, is for you to look at that balance. Notice the numbers. Notice how they're going down. Admittedly, not much. It's just a couple of candles. But as many things burn, especially anything that's, shall we say, an organic base or a carbon based material burns, it loses weight. Now, today we know that that's because it's reacting with oxygen in the air, forming carbon dioxide that's getting up and leaving. But in the 17th century, air was just air. We didn't know it was made of stuff. And hey, why was the mass going down? This then led us into an interesting question and an interesting thought of way of doing things. The model was called phlogiston, which is simply Latin for fire particle. We knew things were escaping, so we thought it was the fire that was escaping. Yeah, the Australian elements were still fairly uh, fresh in everyone's mind, but hey, this model works. And to do that, I need to bring you over to a different flame. This is that other flame. This is a hurricane lamp, admittedly a product of the 19th century, but it shows us how understanding how fire works uh, led us to make better and more useful products, including this critter. So this guy's going to have a hurricane lamp because it can block uh, cross breezes and, if you believe the marketing, it won't be blown out in a hurricane. It probably will be. Probably bad things happen with fire and hurricanes, so you know, blow out your lamps before the hurricane hits. Uh, but Let's look at this guy. You'll notice he has this chimney. Now this chimney serves a couple of purposes. For starters, it's actually stopping the breeze, what makes it the hurricane lamp. But it's also redirecting air. Now with phlogiston theory, it was thought that things that burn give off a fire particle. But it doesn't just go away, it has to be carried away. It has to be carried away by air. What was then called dephlogistonated air would come in, pick up the phlogiston, and go off in what was now known as phlogistonated air. We now know that it was actually oxygen and carbon dioxide respectively, but you know, you got to start with some place. This then told us a couple of things. Fire absolutely depended on air. So you needed a good flow of fresh air in order to get the fire to burn, which is entirely correct. You need the oxygen. So how does this get this? Well, as you know, when things get hot, they expand and become less dense. So as the flame burns inside the chimney, it's hollow, so the air expands and rises. As the air expands and rises, it leaves a slight vacuum on the inside in which cooler air from around the room can enter. But you're saying, how? It looks sealed. Ah, but not quite. As you look inside of here, there's a little bit of a scalloping. The glass doesn't sit directly down on the metal plate. It's got a few air holes, enough room so that the cool air can come in, it pushes out the hot air, and you get new fresh air that's then warmed, rises, and the cycle continues. This cycle then allows the fire to go. Yay, phlogiston works, and it is actually successful. The problem, of course, goes back to when we put things on balances. If you're particularly careful, and you burn something that's, say, a metal. Now, let's talk about the problem with phlogiston. Yes, it works for this. It works great. It's a wonderful model. The problem, of course, is it doesn't work everywhere. If you burn, instead of an organic compound, something with carbon, you burn a metallic thing, say, some zinc or magnesium, like you would get in a road flare, yeah, it doesn't get lighter it gets heavier. It actually gets a lot heavier. Initial experiments missed this. Uh, early combustion quite often would lose lots of the product. If you burn the magnesium, it does start to sputter and spurt around, and you get a lot that 
isn't really a gas, but it, it goes briefly into that phase or uh, away in a like manner. But if you control the burner, carefully burning it, then what you'll find is that your mass goes up, and actually goes up considerably, as you start transitioning from metal to a metal oxide, effectively rusting, but you know, in a much quicker approach. Now, if fire particles are leaving my metal, why is the mass going up? Now, you would think the obvious thing would go is like, oh, shucks, we've been wrong all along. You would think that, but no. Uh, personal beliefs can be quite strong, and so the proposal is, no, we're not wrong. There's a type of negative mass phlogiston. Yeah, once you start talking negative mass stuff, you should be starting to go, wait, what, huh? But that was a thought. We weren't wrong. We were making a, a what's called a type 1 error. We had a pattern, we saw it, and we were sticking to it, even though it wasn't particularly true. Now, in the 18th century, towards the end of the 18th century, we start getting this idea uh, that, hey, there's this thing called oxygen. Maybe it's involved. It's what we were calling dephlogistinated air. And if oxygen's actually another substance, it could be forming, and forming either a gas, like carbon dioxide with these carbon ones, or it could be forming a solid, like in the metals, and thus explaining it. And that's an incredibly oversimplified view of our understanding of fire now. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into the flame than just simply oxygen and fuel. But that took a little while to replace the phlogiston. In fact, really, what it took was that the old proponents of phlogiston, they quit, or more likely died. And the younger people, who frankly weren't so invested in phlogiston theory and had read the works of folks proposing this crazy controversial oxygen stuff, well, they were the ones in charge. And the idea of phlogiston died out not by the weight of evidence, which, I mean, was definitely there, but by the fact that the supporters of phlogiston died, which is kind of a sad way for progress, but is too often the case. Uh, so that's phlogiston. An interesting backstory uh, within chemistry, cautionary tales, and definitely an interesting thought on how you can be completely 100% wrong and still be incredibly helpful and useful. With that said, have a wonderful day.